I don't enjoy coach journeys. They give me really bad travel sickness. Something about bouncing around, old smelly seats and the lack of proper toilet facilities really don't vibe with me. I would always prefer a train for a long distance journey. But maybe my travel sickness is from another reason. Well, today's story makes me think there is. In 2002, an intercity bus in Bolivia ended up being the cause of multiple people being exposed to radiation. Yes, you heard me correctly, a radiation bus. But it's not for what you think. The bus wasn't nuclear powered, it was running on good old diesel. It was more its cargo that was the concern. Stay tuned to find out more. Today, we're going to have a short dive into the 2002 Cuchabamba radiological incident. My name is John and of course you're watching Plainly Difficult. This video wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for my Patreon, YouTube and Ko-fi members. Check out the links below for early access as well as ad-free videos and other bits and pieces as well at some levels getting your lovely name at the beginning of each of my videos. background. So for this section of our video today, I'm going to talk about this organisation, IB Norca. It is a non-profit that was formed in Bolivia in 1992. It is responsible for setting national technical standards. It replaced a government organisation that undertook similar roles. The organisation also issues quality control certificates and operates accredited training for various industries. The company has around 40 employees, well at least in 2002, where our video is concerned. It has a few subsidiaries. One for today is rather important, and that is the National Centre for Welding. This part of the company offered a service for non-destructive weld testing. This was done with a single 192 Iridium special form sealed source housed in a Model 660 remote exposure container made by AEA Technology QSA Inc, which is a US-based company. Due to there only being one unit available for the company, and because testing is done both in the field around Bolivia and at their shielded radiology facility on Avenue Camacho in La Paz, the equipment got a lot of usage and also a lot of transportation. Now, because IB Norca used radiography equipment, they fell under the regulations of the Bolivian Institute of Nuclear Science and Technology. And in 1997, new rules came into place where all companies needed to be licensed and properly regulated in line with international standards. IB Norca didn't apply for their license until 2001. We'll come back to this in a bit later on in the video. Anywho, the single 192 Iridium device worked like this. They had three main parts, the source container, a guide tube and a 20 meter long drive cable with a crank at the end. The container had from outside to inside an outer shell, then polyethylene foam around a depleted uranium shield around a source tube which is in an S shape, which had plugs at each end. Inside there was a source pellet and at one end of this there was a 15 cm cable attached to it and this is called the pigtail. When in use the pigtail is attached to a 20 meter long drive cable which is then in turn attached to a crank. The guide tube can be extended by adding pieces, the end of which is known as the snout. This is placed where the radiography exposure is meant to take place. So before an exposure, and while still safely wound inside the container, the snout is placed at the weld that needs to be tested. A piece of photographic film is placed behind the weld. The crank is operated until the source grain is wound out to the end of the snout. A pre-calculated exposure time is waited whilst gamma radiation is given off by the Iridium-192 source, which the gamma rays pass through the material being tested. As they pass through, some are absorbed more or less depending on the thickness of the material. The more that is absorbed means the area is thicker. Thus, if less is detected, then the material is thinner. And in the weld, this hints towards a void, crack or other defect. The photographic film captures this and after processing will show the darker spots and lighter spots. And darker means more rays have passed through the material and is thus thinner. I think I kind of explained that okay, but sorry if I didn't. So in a machine like this, 
making sure your radioactive source is safely housed is important, wouldn't you say? Yes, obviously. However, keep that also in mind for later on. IB Norca is employed across the country to undertake non-destructive testing, which requires transporting of their equipment. How would you say that this is done? Private car, van, plane, train? Well, how about on a public bus service? That is exactly the way the company would transport its equipment, by booking it on the Bolivian equivalent of a Greyhound bus as cargo. This would later be cited as one of the reasons for the company's operations license refusal, which also included staff not having undertaken the appropriate training, out-of-date dose meters, and improper paperwork supplied with their application. Also, the whole transport issue required them to have a vehicle with correct signage and proper controls for a radiological incident, things that most public transport buses don't generally have. But luckily for them, their 2001 kickback wouldn't affect their abilities to work, as it was during a transitional period where the companies were given some time to improve. The Radiological Accident it is 9.30 on the Saturday 13th of April 2002 and a coach is pulling into the airport at Cochabamba. Aboard the cargo area is IB Norca's Type 660 remote exposure container housing its 0.67 terabecules of 192 iridium source. It had been transported to Cochabamba from its last job in Uro. In Cochabamba, the radiography machine is to be used to check the welds on some 2-inch gas pipelines which are being installed near the airport. After its journey on the bus, the radiographer from IB Norca checked the container with a dosimeter. The readings made him confident that the source was correctly seated inside the source container. This would be the only dose rate reading that this person would take for their session today. At between 10 and 11.30 in the morning, the radiographer made 10 exposures of the pipeline. Now, as required by the company's rules, he should have checked his dosimeter to make sure the source was back in the container, but he didn't. At the end of the session, the radiographer started to pack up the equipment, but he found a little bit of an issue. He could not turn the mechanical interlock required to remove the drive cable and crank. This would be activated when the source was not fully retracted, However, the radiographer had wound the cable back enough, but the source and its pigtail had actually become disconnected and was stuck somewhere within the source tube. The radiographer didn't know this. If he used his dosimeter, he would have, but it would turn out that he didn't. Instead, he assumed the source was inside the container and it was likely that some dirt had maybe got into the interlock. He continued to try and free the cable until around 12 p.m after which he called the IB Norca office in La Paz and explained that he thought what the issue was with the source container. So the office told the radiographer to pack up the device and ship it via coach back to La Paz. But he had a problem. It wouldn't all fit in the regular transport carry case. Instead, he did this. What is going on here? Well, he placed the source container at an angle in the carry case and then placed the source tube, crank and drive cable in a cardboard box, all held together with a good old bit of tape. This very safe and well confined arrangement was then taken to the bus station for transport aboard the 1600 surface from Cochabamba to La Paz. The journey would be roughly eight hours and upon departure, it had 33 people aboard. By its destination, it was at full capacity at 55 people. This was due to the bus making stops along the way. The radiography machine was sitting the whole time under the passengers' feet in the cargo hold. Arriving in La Paz at around midnight, the bus's passengers made off onto their connecting journeys. The cargo was left aboard the bus overnight for unloading in the morning. Two members of staff arrived at 10am to collect the package, but due to another staff member's name being on the address label, they would have to return at 2pm with this member of staff to get the package released to them. Once claimed, the package was placed in the boot of a taxi for a 10 minute journey to the company's offices. Don't forget that each time the package was moved, no one thought to put a dosimeter over it to check it. The three workers manhandled the radiography machine into the shielded room at the office. During the movement, no one was wearing any personal dosimeters. It was only after the radiography machine was inside the shielded room that a dosimeter was finally used to check 
the radiation of the machine. The dosimeter started going crazy. It was telling him that the source was not in a safe position. Not only that, but the rates were too high for the meter, not allowing the staff to figure out exactly where the source was, either in the container or in the guide tube. After checking it over, the staff came to the conclusion that the source must be in the guide tube. In order to figure this out, they used a cable hole in the confinement in the containment's wall to push the tip of the source guide tube through to see if the radiation reduced or not to find the exact location of the source. They basically made a radiation glory hole. After discovering where the source was, it was reattached using tongs and wound back into the container. The event was actually now over, but the IB Norca director wasn't informed until the next day, who then also didn't inform the government body in charge of radiography, IB10, by writing until the 17th of April, four days after the initial issue at Cochabamba. In the meantime, multiple people had been unknowingly exposed and thus not properly treated. Aftermath Dose rates for the four staff members were made, estimating the maximum to be 0.72 grey, which would end up with recommendations of blood testing. And after a number of tests, luckily, nothing concerning showed up. But it wouldn't be until July that the bus passengers estimated doses would be attempted. Don't forget they were sitting above the exposed source for up to eight hours. This was put at the highest estimated dose at 2.5 grey way higher than the staff members. Finding these people proved to be near impossible, even though extensive newspaper and TV advertisements were placed. For reference, a whole body dose of anything above 5 grey can be deadly. The event resulted in the IAEA being called in. They undertook experiments with a similar bus to work out the potential doses the bus passengers would have received, and the results were far more reassuring with a maximum high of 1.2 grey at the feet of the seats over the cargo area. And although higher than recommended for the public, a dose as much as this is fairly low in the grand scheme of things. It would turn out that IB Norca was rather lucky. The company would be hit with some legal issues, and this included, as stated by the IAEA, a maximum fine of 10 minimum standard monthly salaries. This was approximately $500 seizure and decommissioning of the radiography source and container, the temporary suspension of all radiography work by IB Norca, the obligation to identify and locate people involved in the accident, and finally, the re-export of the radioactive source to the supplier. Not the worst penalty I know, especially when the outcome could have been on Goiania levels, if the source had been higher in levels of radiation, or if the source was a different one, for example Cobalt-60, which does have a much longer half-life. Regardless, it was a very close call. So that's my video on the Cochabamba disaster. It's going to be a 1 on the scale, and this is what I've got for my root cause analysis card. Do you agree? Let me know. In the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in the currently cold and miserable corner of Southern London, UK. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, can you play us out, please? One, two, three, four,